Welcome everyone to a mini lecture about diagrams and Reidemeister moves. This this word here is Reidemeister. It's the name of a German topologist uh, from the, I guess, the middle of the 20th century. And uh, the relevant part of the notes we're covering today is uh, definition 1.8 to theorem 1.12. Uh, that's uh, between pages two and three, roughly. Um, now, what is the idea of this uh, material? It's that we are going to study uh, knots and links, and as you know, knots and links are things that live in three dimensions. But we're going to study them by drawing pictures of them. Uh, so we're going to study these things using their diagrams which live in R2 uh, so let's begin so here from the notes is the definition of diagram a diagram of a link L is a good shadow of L together with the data of under and over crossings. So what do these words mean? What's a shadow? What's a good one? And what's this data? Well that's what I'll tell you just now. First, what is a shadow of a link L? A shadow of L is the image of L under some projection from R3 to R2. Now what do we mean when we say we project from R3 to R2, well, um, that's just taking a linear map, a surjective linear map from R3 to R2, whoops, and uh, taking the image of the subset L in R3 under that map. Um, but basically, what it says is, if the link is a is an object in R3, you choose a direction from which to look at it, and then you draw its picture in R2 from that direction. So for example, if this is the trefoil thought of as a subset of R3, of course we all have to have the eye of faith in order to think of this as a subset of R3. Anyway, if we think of this as a subset of R3 um, and we project it uh, down to the plane, uh, which we think of as the plane of the screen here, then we'll get this image, which is a, which is a shadow. And uh, the shadow is, of course, not as nice as the knot. Why? Because it's got crossings in it, points where the shadow intersects itself. And uh, of course, the shadow, uh, taking the shadow is a bad thing to do. Why? Because different knots can have the same shadow. So this knot here has exactly the same shadow as this one here, but this one is the trefoil, which we haven't yet discovered, but will is interesting. It's not the unknot. Uh, whereas this one, uh, perhaps you can see, this is the unknot. I could I could unravel this uh, to get just a single circle. So that's what a shadow is. What is a good shadow? Well, you see, I could make all sorts of mistakes when I take my shadow, and uh, we say that the shadow is good if we didn't make any of those mistakes. So it's a good shadow if there are no triple crossings. We only want two strands to cross each other at the same time. Uh, there should be no tangents, uh, which is to say the, uh, the, the image should either cross itself properly or not touch itself at all. And finally, there are no cusps. There's no points where the, uh, there are no sharp points in the image, let's say. So that's what it means for the shadow to be good. And then uh, we should equip this good shadow with the data of under and over crossings. This shadow here, by the way, is good. And what does that mean? Well, here's a shadow of the trefoil, and here is the shadow of the trefoil equipped with the crossing data. So what I remember is that in my trefoil, this strand here was above this strand here, and I depict that by drawing this strand as going above this one. Similarly, here in my trefoil, this strand 
was above this strand and I depict it by drawing it that way. So we've come full circle. In other words, the drawings I've been drawing of all these knots and links all the time, these are the diagrams that we're talking about now. So this idea of the diagram, it's exactly what we've been doing all along. And for the rest of the course, almost, um, we're, we're usually going to study knots and links only by their diagrams. Now, we come to an extremely important theorem. It's called Reidemeister's theorem. It says the following, that diagrams D and D1 and D2, they represent equivalent links. In other words, the links they represent are the same, they're equivalent, they can be deformed within R3, if and only if the diagrams differ by a sequence of Reidemeister moves and deformations of diagrams that preserve the crossing data. So certainly, if I, if I, if I take a diagram and say rotate it through 90 degrees, well, that represents uh, the same knot or link uh, as the previous diagram. Uh, however, you could do something more complicated, and that's what these Reidemeister moves say. So, what are the Reidemeister moves? I've drawn their pictures over here. We say, for example, let's think about the Reidemeister move R2. We say that two diagrams differ by Reidemeister move R2 if I can find a region of the first diagram that looks like this image and by replacing this image with this one I obtain the second diagram. In other words, two diagrams differ by a Reidemeister move if I can find a little region in each such that replacing one with the other uh, I've just done one of these three moves. Whoops. So very important. Reidemeister's theorem is an if and only if statement. If two diagrams differ by a Reidemeister move, then they represent the same link. And indeed, what that means is uh, that these moves replacing something like this with something like this you should be able to realize them by smooth deformations inside R3. And hopefully you can see that uh, for the diagram, this is a magical process going from here to here because there used to be a crossing and now it's disappeared. On the other hand, in three dimensions, it's obvious that these two are equivalent because I could just take this little loop and unravel it, straighten it out, pull this string tight to get this one. Similarly, uh, I can move from this uh, this little bit of link to this one simply by sliding them apart. And here I slide this over strand down across the crossing to this under strand. So it's clear that these moves can be realized in three dimensions. The real power of Reidemeister's theorem is that it tells you the converse. If two diagrams represent equivalent links equivalence realized by some very large and complicated move in three dimensions. If the two diagrams represent equivalent links, then the two uh, diagrams differ by these Reidemeister moves. Okay, so enough waffling. Here are some examples. Uh, I've, I've listed the three Reidemeister moves down the bottom there. And let's try and prove for ourselves, uh, say, that this not diagram here is equivalent to this not diagram here. And the way we're going to prove that this, <laughs> uh, that, uh, well, we're going to, we're sort of making two statements at once. We're saying that this not thought of as living in R3 is equivalent to this not living in R3. Or we're saying that this diagram and this diagram differ by a Reidemeister move. So let's see that the diagrams differ by a Reidemeister move. Um, so let's take a new copy of this. Whoops. What I do is 
I find a region inside my diagram that looks like one or other side of one of these moves. And the region I'm going to take is going to be this box here. And can you see that inside the box, my diagram looks like the left-hand side of Reitermeister move one. There's a strand that comes down, goes over a crossing, loops back round under the same crossing. That's the same as what happens here. Down, over a crossing, loops back round under the same crossing. And then what happens is I apply Reitermeister move number one. And the effect it has, this is a bad way to erase, okay. I'm just going to redraw the whole thing. So the region outside the box we leave as it was. The region inside the box, which used to look like the left-hand side of R1, we're now going to replace it with the right-hand side of R1, which is a strand that goes straight uh, from one end to the other. Go straight from one end to the other. And we see that what we've done is we've replaced this diagram here with this diagram here. In other words, we've gone from the left to the right there. Now let's see a different example. Let's see um, how to get between this link and this one. Sorry, I should correct my language. I want to see how to get from this link diagram to this one, because if I think of these as links living in R3, then it's clear that these are equivalent by a deformation that just picks up the left-hand circle and slides it to the left a little bit until they no longer overlap. But let's see why these two diagrams differ by Reitermeister moves. So let's take ourselves another copy of the first one. And again, let's search for a little region inside this diagram that resembles one or other of the sides of one of these three moves. And uh, can you see it? It's here. I'm going to draw this little box. Here. And then what we've got is a little bit, uh, a little region of the diagram that exactly resembles the left hand side of move R2. So what do I do? I leave the outside, uh, I leave the part of the diagram outside the box as it was. I apply R2. And what I do is I replace what's uh, what used to be inside the box, which looked like this, with this now. And so, what I what is that? That's a that's a strand going from top to bottom, and another one going from top to bottom. So, there we go, and twice. So we're replacing this diagram with this one. Okay, so that's the end of our lecture. Um, I hope this was useful. Rider-based moves are typically quite confusing, so um, uh, don't despair. <laughs>